dignitaries, scholars, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. On behalf of Punjab University, I welcome you all to the third Satpal Mittal Memorial Lecture being organized under Bharti Chair in Telecom and IT at University Institute of Engineering and Technology, Punjab University, Chandigarh. We are extremely honored to have with us a luminary in the field of telecommunication engineering, Ms. Deepa Tyagi, Senior DDG and Head, Telecom Engineering Center, Department of Telecommunications, Ministry of Communications, Government of India, India as the expert speaker for this lecture. The telecom industry is going through a transformational phase of development and the today's topic lecture is future telecom technologies which help to acclimatize the audience as per the new technological trends in this domain. We are also privileged to have representatives from Bharti Group who have spared their time to join us for today's lecture. Before we start this session, I would like to introduce Shri Satpal Mittalji, a visionary leader. Shri Satpal Mittal started his political career when he was student. He was actively involved in addressing problems concerning the youth. In 1958, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru selected him as a deputy leader of Indian youth delegation to the former Soviet Union. An excellent orator and a keen debater, Mr. Mittal gained prominence in Punjab legislative circles in 1961 when he was elected to the Legislative Council. He became Deputy Minister for Home in Punjab. He was elected twice to the Rajya Sabha for a term of six years in 1976 and 1982. Further, the President of India nominated him as a member of Rajya Sabha in appreciation for his contribution to the public causes, especially his dedication to the cause of downtrodden and towards population issues globally. Throughout his political career, Mr. Mittal was part of several industry associations and policy-making bodies related to parliamentary on population and development. He also served as a member of parliament. He was chairman Indian Association of Parliamentarians on Population and Development. He was President Nehru Siddhant Kendra Trust Vice President Punjab Pradesh Congress Committee and he was advisory panel in the advisory panel of Indian Council of Cultural Relations for South and Southeast Asia. As a chairman of IAPPD, he took upon himself the daunting task of tackling the problems of population facing the country and made it a people's movement. Unique in Asia, the center catered to the ideological orientation courses, seminar, and data information on population and development-related subjects. For Satpal Mittal's perseverance and zeal in promoting new concept on population control, United Nations decorated him with the prestigious United Nations Peace Medal in 1987. He organized several national and international conferences which involves spiritual and parliamentary leaders. He spoke passionately at the historic Global Survival Conference at Oxford and in Moscow in 1990 and made valuable suggestions for human survival and sustainable development. He was equally concerned about apartheid in South Africa, for which the then Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi appreciated his efforts. At a prayer meeting held in Mr. Mittal's memory on January 24, 1992, the then Prime Minister, Shri P. V. Narsimha Rao, described Mr. Mittal as a man of very strong willpower who was passionately involved in activities related to population and development and had observed that the Mr. Mittal's presence at any meeting would ensure that a balanced result would emerge out of his discussions. So we are really privileged to have the Bharti chair in his name. Now I invite Professor Harish Kumar to present a brief about Bharti chair and activities under the chair. Yep. Uh, thank you, Professor Sakshi. So before uh, uh, introducing about the Bharti chair, let me introduce uh, Punjab University. Punjab University, which is fourth oldest university in modern India, was established in 1882 
when the country was partitioned in 1947 university was also partitioned and along with the population which migrated from pakistan uh, now pakistan to uh, india so university also migrated uh, uh, along with them and uh, was settled initially in delhi shimla solan jalandhar amritsar husharpur etc and ultimately in chandigarh and punjab university offers uh, almost uh, every uh, education and research in every field be it medical pharmaceutical sciences sciences engineering management uh, social sciences languages arts etc and uh, university uh, is ranked uh, second in atal ranking of institutions on innovation achievements by ministry of education in year 2020 2020 and uh, by times higher education world ranking universities put into the fourth rank bracket in 2021 across india and it is nac a grade university university has a faculty strength of approximately 1000 out of which 600 belong to science and technology departments and in campus students in the university are approximately 18000 whereas uh, other set of uh, 227000 are studying either in the affiliated colleges or in the open learning system and it offers numerous courses uh, in undergraduate pg integrated program phd program etc and the university campus uh, in chandigarh is spread over 550 acre over two sectors in chandigarh and it has uh, 78 teaching departments and 15 centers and chairs bharti chair is one of them Uh, it has a large number of uh, affiliated colleges regional four regional centers and six constituent colleges and the university campus is a mini township with uh, 40 plus academic buildings 22 hostels seven guest houses and within this university uh, bharti chair is located a uh, little bit of the history of the bharti chair it was established by the endowment given by uh, shri sunil bharti mittal who is chairman of bharti enterprises in year 2002 Shri Sunil Bharti Mittal visited uh, Punjab University campus uh, in September 2002 uh, for this particular uh, start of this particular endowment and uh, at that point of time scope of activities were defined for this chair uh, it was uh, expected that research activities related to industry oriented towards telecom and IT and focus focusing on the rural development and healthcare using telecommunication technology also uh, it was expected to organize satpal memorial lecture in telecom and it along with some hackathons workshops conferences seminars etc and it will participate and uh, obtain the membership of national and uh, global standard development organizations uh, this is the profile of bharti chair currently uh, mrs uh, pramila kumar uh, she is distinct professor bharti chair since uh, 2016 onward currently full time she is occupying as director general telecom uh, standard development society of uh, india which is uh, uh, india sdo for standard development in telecom sector she is also president of cloud computing innovation council of india she has a vast experience of 34 plus years in industry uh, she is uh, alumni of punjab university and also did uh, uh, ms from reuters university along with the executive uh, program from uh, indian institute of management bangalore and uh, she is uh, in the governing bodies of different uh, standard organizations and uh, her experience includes uh, 5g 6g iot telecom networks and cloud computing uh, before joining of uh, pamila uh, dr dn singh was bharti chair professor during uh, 2005 to 2008 he was full time professor on this chair and uh, he was alumni of iit delhi and bhu iit Uh, before joining bharti chair professor he was executive director of semiconductor complex limited which is now a department of space lab which is a unique lab in india uh, having a vlsi manufacturing facilities uh, since uh, 25 years uh, in working and currently dr dn singh joined as the cto uh, in the indo solar limited uh, in the last couple of years uh, under the bharti chair uh, these are the activities which have been organized first satpal mittal memorial lecture was delivered by uh, shri vipan tyagi who was uh, executive director of uh, c dot second uh, uh, satpal Mem- uh, memorial Mit- uh, lecture was delivered by dr baskar ramamurthy uh, who is director of iit madras 
and uh, uh, UIT is also institutional member of TSDSI in the Bharti chair. And another M2M workshop was organized along with the India EU corporate, uh, uh, cooperation project in 2018. And a, recently, a special session on telecom and IT development of use cases in healthcare and agriculture, which is organized uh, uh, by IEEE Australia. Uh, and uh, UIT organized this session in the virtual mode during the COVID pandemic time. And related to industry and academia activities, uh, UIT collaborated with CDOT, uh, two visits, one from the faculty of UIT to CDOT for this collaboration. And then again, uh, CDOT team visited UIT for uh, collaborating uh, on uh, common service platform for M2M and IoT communication. And UIT team has also participated in numerous uh, uh, workshops like smart city workshops, smart city task force, 5G technology and standardization workshop, uh, India Mobile Congress, then uh, 1M2M testing and certification uh, topics and uh, different webinars in India-EU collaboration, etc. And uh, uh, UIT team has also been co-organizer of Women in Engineering track continuously in 10th, 13th and 14th IEEE advance, uh, Advances in Network and uh, Telecommunication Systems Conference, which is organized by IEEE uh, communication society uh, at uh, uh, in 2016 at IIC Bangalore, in 2019 at Bitspilani uh, in Goa campus, and in 2020 at IIIT Delhi in the virtual mode. And uh, these are some of uh, the contributions by Telecom Research Lab, which is in UIAP. Uh, uh, this lab has developed uh, one project named Nesanchar, which is right now uh, in, pro uh, in process of the technology approval by Telecommunication Engineering Center. And uh, they collaborated with India EU Center of Excellence and also and uh, organized uh, 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 an online uh, summit on Atamnagar Bharat uh, along with ICMR as the partner. And uh, uh, the faculty members are also member of uh, uh, TEC, different TEC working groups. Some of them include NWG 17, which is by Telecom Security Division and uh, uh, two groups by IoT division. One is Smart Grid to study IoT and 5G technology application. Another is related to security uh, by design principles. Uh, this is the plan uh, proposed by the team UIT for the next two years. Uh, in next two years, team will focus on having a living lab in the Punjab University campus in collaboration with CDOT and uh, IIIT Hyderabad. It will focus on developing use cases uh, in the agriculture and health sector and team will also focus on patent and technology transfer in the area of uh, IOMT in internet of medical things M uh, M2M machine to machine learning 5G and 6G and proof of concept for innovative solutions and products in the domain of uh, telecommunication and medical technology devices and services team will also focus on organizing training and awareness workshops in the same areas and will participate in the standardization meetings. Thank you. Uh, now I request uh, uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Raj Kumar, uh, to give his inaugural address. Professor Raj Kumar, please. Okay. We can't hear him. Is he online? Yeah, uh, Professor Rajkumar, uh, due to some reason, uh, was not able to join. He joined, but uh, uh, he left the meeting. So now we will proceed further. Okay. Maybe we can get him later uh, whenever yeah. he is available. Yeah, yeah. So now I request uh, Professor J.K. Uh, Goswami, who is Director UIT, 
to address uh, to give the negative address uh, good morning everybody uh, i'm really it's a pleasure to ha have this day when uh, we have with us uh, madam pamela kumar and uh, madam uh, deepa tyagi uh, uh, for her uh, <coughs> Uh, lecture on future te uh, uh, telecom technologies so i was going through that madam is going to talk about the future uh, telecom technology that are going to come so overnight i was, I was looking on that why the need of communication came up that was my basic uh, thing that i started pondering over so i went on to the origin of uh, uh, human beings and i found somehow that the communication was the one reason where this thing started socializing that the isolated human being started talking about social uh, setting up into tribes and clans and uh, to say uh, that uh, a kind of society was built from that then uh, slowly and slowly uh, communication became a need then it it became a kind of luxury also and it also became a very strong need to save countries Uh, when the coded like communication and everything came up and now you find that the communication has grown, grown not only to the verbal communication it is also beyond that uh, if if i talk only in the human sense it is a, even the non verbal gestures are a part of communication where, where we call it soft skills and uh, we find that communication has taken up everything in the world and has changed the scenario totally but one thing uh, which worries me is that finally as the communication is growing we are back into decorated caves that is the things like virtual reality and all those have coming up so uh, this is a platform where eminent personalities are uh, uh, present so i would request everybody that whatever technologies come up one should look look into the social affairs also that we don't really lose the real grounds uh, on the basis of uh, uh, the, the uh, advancement in uh, these uh, these kind of technologies because somehow that social aspect also has to be given room otherwise the evolution of human beings uh, are uh, is also suffering another uh, aberration because of the what you call as the virtual realities or uh, virtual so uh, socialization uh, uh, with these uh, words uh, i hope that the future technologies uh, what madam deepa uh, tyagi will be talking about it will be very interesting to uh, have and uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, discussions over uh, uh, her ideas thanking you thanks a lot uh, now i request uh... Pamela, madam, to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker of the day, Professor Pamela. Yes, thank you very much. It is indeed a very, a very special moment for me to introduce with with a lot of pride my friend and colleague, Ms. Deepa Tyagi, as the senior DDG of TEC, and and it is a privilege to have her. come and address us here in the satpal memorial lecture for uh, punjab university uh, you know what is very special about this is also that whereas as professor goswami pointed out uh, the the feel of uh, you know not being face to face uh, is there is uh, is you know missing in the in the virtual format but however the reach in the virtual format is much more so in our earlier lectures with uh, vipin tyagi and professor baskar ramurthy we were limited by the uh, by the uh, you know limits of the of the of the auditorium and how many people could come there and uh, you know this memorial lecture is really gaining a lot of popularity because even then the rooms were would be full but now this is being streamed uh, uh, you know across uh, facebook and <laughs> and uh, um uh, youtube and the reach is much much more and also the lecture will be preserved for for uh, posterity so um, so before i get into the formal introduction i would like to share my personal uh, <coughs> perspective on 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 deepa tyagi you know i have known her for the last um, 
almost four years and and every interaction with her is is such a pleasure she's so bubbling with positivity and um, and objectivity so every interaction is is uh, you know you come back with a good some good insights and a lot of positive energy every time that i have met her and whenever you reach out to her you can be assured that she will give you a very patient listening and a very objective consideration of uh, of your issues deepa and I, i have also shared a lot of uh, such platforms together uh, you know in in delhi in many many conferences and workshops and i've always been very impressed with the insights that she brings and the, and the deep understanding of the indian telecom ecosystem and india's telecom journey that she has which comes from her first hand uh, depth and breadth of experience that she has had over her journey of 35 plus years so deepa tyagi uh, uh, has uh, 35 years of very rich and diverse experience uh, in the field of mobile communications fixed broadband networks and setting of telecom standards in 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 for indian telecommunication she joined the government of india as an india telecom it services officer the its in the its category in 1983 she is a an alumnus of iit roorkee uh, and uh, management development institute gurgaon she ser- she has served in various capacities in the department of telecommunications as well as in various public sector un- uh, units uh, basically all all the important ones which is bbnl bharat broadband network limited bharat sanchar nigam limited bsnl and mtnl and that's where her, the richness of her experience comes from as a as one of the earliest officers to be posted on deputation to bbnl for india's flagship project bharat net she was responsible for conception design development in, and implementation of data communications network for monitoring of the passive optical network equipment installed in the gram panchayats across india so i guess in this uh, ro- मैम वी लॉस्ट यूर वॉइस हेलो कृष्ण सर telecom equipment in this day in this time with telecom proliferating into all the, the life uh, line services it is becoming uh, and and the way uh, you know cyber security and the challenges to uh, to cyber security it's becoming very very imperative for india to do its own testing and uh, who better than deepa tyagi to drive this and make the big change that uh, we are uh, uh, geared up for so so over to you now uh, ms deepa tyagi for your uh, lecture we are all very eagerly awaiting to hear from you uh thank you ma'am thank you uh, professor pamila now i request uh, uh, deepa tyagi madam to deliver the bharti chair lecture uh ye okro अभी अभी शेयर 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 नहीं आएगा तो तो खड़े ऐसे ही आएगा कंटेंट 
thank you professor harish kumar thank you pamela ji for saying all those nice words for me pranam namaskar good afternoon to all of you who have logged in today it is indeed my very proud privilege to be here as a keynote speaker during the third sat paul mittal memorial lecture organized under bharti chair for telecom and it at uiet the university institute of engineering and technology punjab university at chandigarh thank you video is on can you enable your video please yeah am i can i be seen now yes 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 <laughs> uh yeah was i audible when i was speaking yes your audio is fine now your video is also there thank you so much oh yeah hi so thank you all of you for having given me this opportunity to be here to be able to address you all i feel terribly privileged and greatly honored of course the topic given to me for today is future telecom technologies so i would be essentially structuring my talk around uh, three themes first of course the role of telecom the role of standardization and in brief the role of tec of which i am the head right now my the second theme would be the actual emerging technologies i'll be covering uh, major 3 4 technologies and the impact that one is expect the uh, that uh, one expects out of these technologies on uh, general uh, mankind in general and of course the third and the most interesting probably theme why would would be some basic guiding mantras to sail through the journey of life which i have grown up with and i would like to share with all the audience today of course i have lots of technical stuff plenty of slides and would be happy to share with you all my slides of the presentation subsequently but i will not be sticking to the sequence of slides very religiously so kindly pardon me so in fact the other day i was watching a tv program on one of the channels where there was a discussion going on with mr ruchir sharma in fact he is an a grade economist who is currently heading the emerging markets division in morgan stanley and he made a very interesting and a very pertinent remark he said india is a country that consistently disappoints both the pessimists and the optimists and look how correct he was as i was collecting some interesting statistics for my talk today i found that we surely disappoint the pessimists because we have done pretty well for their liking today we have the world's second largest telecom network second only to china we have become world's largest consumers of data data guzzlers as they would call it we have the cheapest internet providing access to about 700 million users which is world's second largest pool of internet users comprising more than 12% of all users globally according to a 2018 report by indian council for research on international economic relations every 10% increase in india's internet traffic delivers a 3.1% increase in per capita gross domestic product contribution of digital revolution in economic growth job creation and human developments has been significant and is only growing by the day India shows up on top of AI skills penetration across many sectors in online job platforms yet India continues to disappoint the optimists as there is still lots of things that are left to be done about 50% population in India lacks internet access and even if they can get online only about 20% of them know how to use digital services the benefits of gains that accrue due to increase in internet traffic are still limited due to into issues such as 
as low smartphone penetration while government run digital ones are areas broadband network and penetration of smartphones in these areas is still a challenge reliable power supply still remains a challenge in a lot of our rural areas making digital transactions user friendly and secure so that that have tried remains a challenge it remained deep and persistent it is multi dimensional and it is growing across states within states and even across gender groups but technology probably will be able to provide solutions to all these problems and clearly telecom technological trends will hopefully pave the way towards an improved and a more empowered india each new technology often brings with it several challenges and the key is how not to get overpowered by the new technologies but to get empowered by technology now having made this starting comment i would now start with my presentation so is uh, my slides visible yes ma'am uh, these are visible so what is the important since i am heading the telecom engineering center i would like to first begin my presentation with the importance of standardization now standardization is plays a very important role in achieving interoperability of new technologies and it brings significant benefits to both industry and consumers in fact it is essential component of industrial competitiveness it sort of ensures that networks and technologies seamlessly interconnect and strive to improve access to icts to underserved communities worldwide in fact remember every time you make a phone call via the mobile access the internet or send an email you are benefiting from the work of telecom sdos of course some of the major sdos are the international telecom union which any telecom engineer would be very well conversant with it was established in 1865 as part of the united nations specialized agency for icts and it comprises of three sectors the radio communication sector which manages the inter radio frequency spectrum and satellite orbit resources then you have itut which is the standardization sector for telecom it is undertaken by various study groups which i am going to cover subsequently in my presentation and of course the third sector is the telecom development sector itu which helps spread equitable sustainable and affordable access to information and communication technologies of course the next very important telecom sdo is ieee which is again a non profit technical professional society with an active portfolio of nearly 1300 standards and projects under development of course one of the more notable ieee standards that i am sure all of us are familiar with is the ieee 802 lan group of standards and IEEE 1547 and the related groups. IEEE standard series P7000 to P7014 sets the standards for the future of ethically aligned autonomous and intelligent systems, including AI. That's a very important series, and people interested in the ethical usages of AI can log into these. another very important sdo is hc european telecom standards institute which is again a non profit standardization organization in the field of ict and basically it has set a lot of standards including global technologies such as gsm 3g 4g 5g dect hc is also a funding partner in 3gpp and 1m2m another very important sdo is iso which is again a non governmental international organization with a membership of over 165 national standards bodies 
It has come out with a lot of standards to ensure quality, safety, efficiency that support innovation and provide solutions to global challenges. Some of the important series of ISO standards are ISO 9000, which is quality management, ISO 14000, environment, ISO 27000, IT, ISO 22000, food safety, management, etc. Then, of course, we have 3GPP, which is an agreement which brings together a number of telecom standards bodies, which are known as organizational partners. And the current organizational partners are Arab, ATIS, CCSA, HC, TSDSI, TTA, and TTC. And we are privileged today to have our DG, Ms. Pamela, who's the Director General of TSDSI Secretariat. Now, what does 3GPP specify? It has specified GSM, which was a 2G technology, followed by WCDMA standards, followed by LTE, the 4G technology, and now it is doing serious work in the realm of 5G. Another very important telecom SDO is 1M2M, and which deals with standards pertaining to M2M and Internet of Things. The project started in 2012, and the partners again are almost the same 3GPP partners, including TSDSI. There are currently 227 participating partners and members include DOT, Indian Institute of Science, many IITs, Triple IT Hyderabad, ISRO, TCIL. So 1M2M members must be members of a 1M2M partner. So as a lot of these are members of TSDSI, so they become members of 1M2M. Now, having just given a brief overview of the international SDOs, I would now like to share a couple of slides on TEC, Telecom Engineering Center. It is a technical arm and an attached office of the Department of Telecom under the Ministry of Communications. And it is also the National Standards Organization for Telecom and related ICT sector. Some of the important tasks which it has been entrusted with are mandatory testing and certification of telecom equipment. It is also the designated national inquiry point for WTO technical barrier to trade for the telecom sector. While for the rest of the sectors, BIS is the national inquiry point, but for all telecom related products, TEC is the designated inquiry point. Then it is also the complaint resolution uh, agency for local content under the public procurement preference to make in India policy, which has been notified by the government. It is an ISO 902015 certified organization. Our vision is to leverage its status as a center of excellence in telecom to position India as a lead telecom knowledge and manufacturing hub of Asia Pacific nations by driving telecom standards, manufacturing support, and network building skill sets in the interests of this region and the market. Of course, apart from the activities which I just listed, we also actively participate in ITU, APT, WRC, and we are the nodal agency for coordinating the standardization activities of ITUT. ITUT has a lot of study groups, and corresponding to each of those ITUT and ITUR study groups, we have national working groups. And some of the important ones I've listed here, I think uh, Professor Harish Kumar mentioned some of them where uh, Punjab University is also actively participating. Uh, we have National Working Group 20 corresponding to IQ Study Group 20, which works on Internet of Things and Smart Cities and Communities. We have Network National Working Group 13, which is dealing with future networks with focus on IMT 2020, cloud computing and trusted network infrastructures. We have NWG 17 on security. NWG 16, which talks about multimedia and also blockchain, which I would be covering subsequently. Of course, let us see the kind of testing and certification that TC does. We have two sets of uh, testing and certification. One is voluntary, wherein anybody interested can pick up the documents that we normally come out with. We have four kinds of standards. One is the type approval. Uh, generic requirements, we have interface requirements. So we give type approvals against our GR standards. We give interface approval against 
IRs. Then we also have certificate of approval against manufacturers' own technical specifications. And then we also do technology approval. Initially, we used to do it only for CDOT, but since last three to four years, we have also now started doing technology approvals of products from other government universities, labs, and I'm proud to share here on this platform that we do have a product from um, UIET, which is currently under uh, the process of technology approval. And I'm very confident that shortly the product may get an approval from TEC. So congratulations to the people who have put in a lot of hard work in this. Thank then you. we have another kind of, yeah. Then we have another kind of certification, which has been uh, started only in 2017, which is the mandatory testing and certification of telecom equipment. Now, what was the driving force? In fact, absence of technical regulations, technological advancements in uh, telecommunications was making national security and user safety vulnerable. And we also had to ensure that any new telecom equipment does not degrade performance of existing networks. So the solution was that we need to have some kind of a mandatory testing and certification of all telecom equipment, which is which gets connected into our Indian telecom network prior to sale, import, or use in India. And this was done through a modification in the Indian Telegraph Rules, ITR, in September 2017. The major objectives of MTCT, of course, are to ensure security, safety of end users, protection of users and public from radio frequency emissions from equipment, and compliance with relevant technical regulations. The, we test against mandatory testing against our uh, essential requirements. Uh, this is the document which we prepare for all the products, and uh, the testing is done against essential requirements. And these documents are finalized after holding a large scale public consultation. And our ERs generally evolve, uh, revolve around the five uh, basic uh, uh, tenets. One is, of course, the safety parameters. Second, very important parameter is the EMI EMC parameters, then followed by technical requirements. Then you have other requirements like specific absorption ratio, which is again very useful, important for, from the health point of view then IPv6 if a product supports that and last but not the least is the security requirements and the entire thing is done online through a portal which has been developed by CDOT. These are about 41 ERs that we have released so far and while we have notified only some of these products thereby meaning that only some of these products have to be necessarily tested against at the MTCT and only after their testing and certification would they be allowed to get installed in the country's network. The rest of the ERs would also be progressively notified and increasingly more and more networks will come under the ambit of MTCTE. Yeah, so right now we have notified uh, uh, telephone equipment, G3 fax, modem, cordless telephone, ISDN, CPE, and PABX as uh, notified products under phase one. And uh, under phase two, we have notified PON equipment, passive optical network family of broadband equipment, and then the IoT based feedback devices and uh, digit, uh, uh, transmission terminal equipment like SDH equipment and multiplexing equipment. So with this, just giving a brief background about the international SDOs and TEC, I would now start with 5G, evolution and the standardization work. So let us quickly see how it has evolved from 1G, which was predominantly a non-cellular voice-based network. We have then gone on to 2G, which was digital, better voice, with a little bit of text messaging. And from there on, we moved on to 3G, which had some basic internet and multimedia. From then on, we went to 4G, which had a lot of mobile broadband, high-speed data, smartphones, 
data up to 1 gbps so we had L we had different variants we have lte we had lte advanced we had lte pro so that's the realm that we are currently in and from there we go on to 5g which would have extreme speed connectivity and reliability so this is truly a platform for future innovations now if you look at this slide it gives you a very clear picture about how long does it take from the time when you conceive of a technology or when you launch the technology to the time when it's at its peak so if from 1980 was the time when your is your generation 1 was launched and it peaked in 1990s and 1990 was the time when your 2g was launched and around 2000 2g gsm w, cdma peaked of course cdma was not very popular in the country and now we only have gsm and the gsm variants and it was around imt 2000 which was the 3g itus 3g equivalent which was launched in 2000 and around 2010 it peaked followed by the launch of 4g in 2010 and we see a peak of 4g today when 3g is being launched and probably by 2030 would be the peak of 5g deployments in the world so this gives you a fairly good idea about the time it takes when a technology is being conceived at the sdo level to the time when it is witnessing a large scale deployment on ground yeah this is generally a comparative uh, uh, table between 2g uh, 3g 4g and 5g so let's look at 5g ITR working party 5D finalized the technical performance requirements and the evaluation criteria for IMT 2020 ITR in their document M.2410. Of course, they specified a lot of performance requirements. So the downlink peak data rate should be 20 Gbps. Uplink data rate should be 10 Gbps. So these were a set of requirements which were spelled out by International Telecom Union, and then. they let out these guidelines to the world and then it was up to the various uh, sdos to develop these technologies and then offer to itu for assessment to be able to qualify as 5g technologies now 5g as defined by itu has essentially three use cases you have enhanced mobile broadband you have massive machine type communications and you have ultra reliable and low latency communications so when enhanced mobile broadband is only extension of what your upload speeds and download two use cases in 5g are some something which is new feature which we have in the previous generations of technology this machine type communications where billions of devices are being conceived they would be interconnected and then you have an ultra reliable and low latency communications for a lot of very mission critical applications like you have e health stuff like that this Side view. So these are the key performance indicators which have been spelt out for IMT 2020 use cases, and for mission critical applications, ultra reliable and low latency use cases. What you need is strong security. You need ultra high reliability. One out of hundred million allowed to be lost. Ultra low latency. second and extreme user mobility or no mobility at all then you have enhanced mobile broadband using 4g scenarios so you have extreme data rates and deep awareness discovery and optimization and then you have the massive internet of things where the challenges are that you have deep coverage you have low energies high life and 
ultra low complexity because hundreds of bits per second only because when you have billions of devices they are spread all over on ground so they would not be requiring too much of bandwidth but they would require huge battery life and extreme capacity so this is again a very famous uh, slide taken from the itu which again says the same thing in a different form and uh, for different for each one of these three use cases you have different kpis so i will not now the, uh, this slide shows you the different kinds of use cases you may have human to human communication you may have human to machine communication and what is new is machine to machine communication now if you look at the three kinds of communications on the x axis and on the y axis you have the three use cases uh, enhanced mobile broadband so what are the applications that come here we have ar vr virtual reality and augmented reality you may have video calling virtual meetings you may have fixed wireless you may have ultra high resolution videos which will form under this matrix then for machine to machine communications and extreme mobile broadband you may have video monitoring you may have mobile cloud computing then massive scale communication which is uh, your uh, massive machine type communication you may see thousands of variables in the network which are anyway currently also very popular and they'll only get more popular with time you may have different multiple social networking sites you may have smart homes where in all your home appliances would be smart and they would be connected you may have healthcare monitoring you may have vehicle to infrastructure communication this will fall under the second use case and the third of course is the ultra reliable low latency services wherein you may have public protection and disaster recovery ppdr services public safety services remote robotic surgeries vehicle to pedestrian communication vehicle to vehicle pedestrian communication and so on so again the same three use cases which have been spelled out by iq now looking at the indian scenario we can use these to provide different types of services in india for example rural broadband enhanced broadband in urban areas enabling smart cities through support for iot enabling critical communication through support for ultra reliable and low latency communication mobile broadband so i think this is a, we can skip this i have already covered this in great detail and in fact massive machine type communication this can also be used in fact one of the very uh, popular uh, use cases is to track containers carrying grains and anything so fleet management is a very popular use case for this wherein you can track containers carrying grains from the villages to the towns or depots for the benefit of the farmers through live tracking which provides more control and features of optimization they can also be used for various aspects of traffic management through implementation of intelligent transportation system and then ultra reliable and low latency communication can be used for providing communications during emergency and disaster you can use it for smart grid for critical networks like power distribution which need utmost reliability they can also be used for factory automation because you need remote control and operation of drones robots involved in manufacturing agriculture so this will improve the manufacturing processes and increase the efficiency so clearly the use cases are many but a lot of challenge is in the way any country goes about using the technology for the purposes that are most critical or most important for the country now this is of course the standardization process which is followed by itu this is an eight step process as i told you earlier also that the first step is of course defining of the technical parameters that what are the minimum requirements which any technology must fulfill to be able to qualify as a certain generation of technology then the various radio interface technologies are developed by various agencies maybe ieee 3gpp hc whoever then these technologies are submitted 
then they are evaluated. So you have basically the processes fall under two categories. There are certain processes which are controlled by ITU and there are certain processes which are conducted by outside ITU agencies. So the requirements are spelt out by ITU, but the development of candidate RITs is done by outside agencies. The submission is again done to ITU, then the ITU looks at them and then gives it to independent assess assessors or evaluation groups who then evaluate, give their reports to ITU, ITU again does the review and finally you declare a technology suitable for a certain generation of technologies. So th these are of course all the performance requirements which had been spelt out by ITU for 5G and subsequently these are the ITUR documents which talk about these performances. So if you're interested, you can pick up these documents and read this. And finally, the report ITUR M2483, which came out in uh, July 2020, which spelt out the outcome of the evaluation, consensus building and decision of the IMT 2020 process, including characteristics of IMT 2020 radio interfaces. So after the assessment, the final outcome was that three terrestrial radio interfaces have been approved by ITU. One is, of course, the 3GPP, 5G set of RITs. Second is the 3GPP, 5G radio interface technology. So it's called RIT, whereas the first one is set of RITs. So the first one covers both LT and 5G, NR, whereas the second one is pure NR, which we call standalone. And of course, the third variant, which is indeed a matter of great pride for India, is 5GI, which has been recognized by IQ as the third 5G technology. And this has been developed indigenously by TSGSI as 5GI RIT. So, by, so it's a matter of great pride for all Indians that this technology has uh, been approved by ITU. And uh, there are two more uh, uh, submissions. One was, of course, by XC, Debt Forum, and one was New Front, which have been given an exceptional review within the IMT process extension, which essentially means that they are supposed to, if they successfully complete the evaluation process, they'll be included in subsequent revisions of this recommendation. So I will quickly, uh, I would like to just quickly, if uh, you permit me, previous, yeah. You may take ma'am time as you want. Uh, there's no need of. Okay, so I, I would just like, yeah, probably it will be of interest to people. So uh, these three technologies which have been approved by IQ as 5G technologies. So, the first one, 3GPP, 5G, SRIT, they have been developed by 3GPP and they consist of long-term evolution LTE and new radio releases 15 and beyond. So here you have the EUTRA, an LTE component of RIT, is based on releases 15 and 16. So you have NRI, NR, RIT as one of the components and you have the LTE component of RIT. The second one, of course, is the 3GPP RIT, which is... Uh, the standalone 5G and it is developed by 3GPP and encompasses the new radio of 5G. The third one, which is TSDSI's RIT, is based on the 3GPP 5G RIT with additional functionality to support low mobility, large cell. Now, this incorporates specific technology enhancements that can enable longer coverage for meeting the LMLC requirements. So, it enables low-cost rural coverage, and this is purported as a key enabler for 5G-based rural broadband usage scenario in India and similarly placed geographies. So this is truly a great achievement for India. So this is just a pictorial representation of the non-standalone, wherein you will continue to have the core of 4G, whereas in the access network, you may have, if your device supports 5G, so for the user plane, it may come through your 5G new radio, whereas the control and the control plane may come through your, will continue to come from your 4G existing core. 
whereas in the standalone mode you have your control as well as the user plane in the 5g realm so this is the difference what is mostly expected in the case of existing operators would be a non standalone mode wherein since they have an extensive lg uh, 4g network so initial deployments of 5g would be seen in terms of non standalone architecture wherein both your core would be the existing lt network and your access network would be a mix of 4g and 5g nrs so a lot of new work is also happening in release 17 because 15 and 16 are already approved and what we call 5g is 3g pp release 15 and 16 and work has already started on release 17 Now let us quickly look at the different deployment strategies which have been adopted for 5G in different countries. One of the most uh, developed telecom networks in the world, uh, SK Telecom in Korea, they have introduced 5G in mid-band, and they have added millimeter wave in B2B and hotspots from 2020. Then you have uh, Vodafone; they have also introduced 5G in mid-band, and then they have added NR on low band to extend coverage. In AT&T USA, they have again used millimeter wave hotspots, creating innovation zones. There is 5G in low band for wide area coverage nationwide. So they are using different strategies, and it may still take a lot of time, a couple of years, before you see a large scale deployment of 5G. So they are being used in pockets and in niche areas for niche applications. Now, some of the very interesting statistics that one comes comes across. as far as projections for 5g are concerned is that 5g coverage will roll out rapidly to cover around 40% of global population by 2025 5g will account for almost 1 in 7 connections as per uh, projections and around 5 billion people are expected to be accessing the internet via mobile by 2025 and already we are seeing 412 operators in 131 countries who have deployed 5g in some form either by way of trials tests or they are planning some pilots and even india is now considering setting up of some pilot networks and we are already in touch with uh, the oems and uh, the service providers and uh, 628 devices have already been announced as per the latest gsma december 2020 report and the march 2021 report 306 phones 122 fixed wireless access cp devices 80 modules and rest have a form factor of routers laptops modems other devices so clearly we find a lot of 5g devices already in the market so having uh, given a broad overview of 5g now my sixth uh, next important technological innovation is 1m2m and iot Now clearly M2M and IoT is one of the most emerging technologies as on date and it is being used to create smart infrastructure in various sectors namely automotive power healthcare smartphones intelligent buildings clearly it is going to revolutionize and change the way all businesses governments and consumers interact with the physical world and there are very interesting projections as per projections by ericsson there may be around 24 billion connected devices across the globe by 2025 and out of this around 21% will be on cellular technologies so this involves a device which could be a sensor or a meter which captures something either heat motion vital sign usage whatever then you need a network for communicating and sending it to your master controller somewhere else and then you have an application which makes sense of the captured data could it be a stolen vehicle or it could be location or whatever so you need a device you need a communications network and then you need an application so internet of things is nothing but sensors actuators connectivity plus data processing and analytics together they give you what we call as internet of things now iq has defined internet of things as uh, things based on existing and evolving interoperable information and communication technologies it has created a study group 20 as i already said and on the same lines tc is also got a national working group 20 which is working on this thing 
projections I've already covered. This is how the scenario is going to be. At the ground level, you are going to have lots of sensor-based devices, actuators. Then in between, you are going to have a conglomeration of communication networks. Those networks could be non-cellular networks. You can have low power, wide area network sensors. You may have Wi-Fi, NFC, Zigbee, Z-Wave. A host of networks are already in place. And you can also have the cellular networks, narrowband IoT, which is being addressed by the 3GPP standardization body. And then on top is your application and then the cloud storage of data and the entire intelligence and the analytics resides at the top. Now, clearly from the technical and the policy makers, there are huge emerging challenges as far as Internet of Things is concerned. Now, if you look at the technical side, you have reliability because the data that is being collected, how reliable is the data, how current is the data, because you are going to do a lot of analytics on this data. So if the data itself is not pure, if the data itself is not current, if the data is not all-encompassing, there could be some problems in the analytics because your, basa is, your data is the basic theme. So how reliable is your data? Then how reliable is your network, power, connectivity, cost, capacity, and even your numbering? Because each of those devices, billions of devices lying in the, on ground, they would need to be addressed and they would need to have, have some kind of an addressing mechanism, IDs, and probably IPv4 may not be enough. Even IPv6 may not be enough. And already, China has submitted a proposal for new IP to ITU. And they clearly say that IPv6 also may not be able to address the uh, addressing requirement which will come in the days to come, considering that you'll be expecting billions of devices which would be there in the network in this connected world. Now, as policymakers, there are a whole lot of issues, and I'm sure you must be all following. There are data localization issues that where does this data reside? It is collected, okay, in your country, but where does it go? Whether you should have open access to data, whether you should, what about the IPR? Who collects the data, but where does the data reside? Who has ownership of the data? Should you allow cross-border traffic? And how do you govern the entire IoT mechanics? So it's a complex, fairly complex uh, gamut of things. And clearly policy and technical, when they converge, you have standards, interoperability, security, privacy, spectrum, and bandwidth constraints, which have to be addressed. And of course, the security challenge is most predominant because you need interoperability required at DNA, basically at the device, at the network, and at the application level. And international organizations are looking into these aspects. TC has also done a lot of work in this area. We have uh, come out with technical reports. There are 13 of them. And they're all available on our TC website. Please do go and have a look. And uh, as I said, that the existing 10-digit numbering plan that we are following for our cellular networks would not have been enough for Internet of Things and machine-to-machine -machine communication. So already TC, as part of its recommendations, had suggested a 13-digit numbering scheme for SIM-based M2M devices and gateways. And uh, this has already been adopted by DOT. And then we have also come out with a specification for embedded SIMs. And uh, we have also recommended some uh, the things for Spectrum for these issues, and which are also currently under examination by WPC. And recently, one M2M SDO that I said, they had come out with a uh, service level interoperability standards. And as TSDSI is a member of, is a partner of one M2M, so TSDSI had transposed those standards and they had offered to TEC. And we are pleased to inform that the TSDSI transposed one M2M standards have been adopted by TEC as national standards. And now we are in the process of writing to uh, Ministry of Urban Development, which is uh, steering the 100 Smart City project. 
and uh, we are writing to them informing them that these are the national standards which have to be adhered to and i'm sure this would give a great fillip to the smart city projects that india has embarked upon so it's a great achievement for india that we have finally been able to declare a national standard for m to m then uh, of course the other things uh, we have also prepared a consumer iot security guidelines because a lot of countries they have come out with some kind of uh, security guidelines you know that how do you ensure the security because once you have billions of devices and your network is only as secure as the weakest link so you have you are actually when you are having it's a connected world and you are having billions of devices in the network so even through one device if there is a virus that can enter the network it can cause havoc have walk in the network so of course this i have covered so these are some of the low power wide area network technologies in iot which are currently being used because cellular technologies for iot are still not very widely deployed so you have uh, non cellular very popular technologies like lora sigfox weightless rpma which are you have a lot of these networks already in place and uh, even 3gpp as part of its cellular lp wan technologies they have finalized in their release 13 standards they have lt mtc they have narrow band iot and they have ec gsm so this is just a brief depiction of cellular and non cellular uh, iot standards so you have lte mg and then you have uh, sigfox loravan and all those things of course as per some uh, global survey these have been adjudged as the most smart cities in the world so new york has been scored high on smart city lighting and smart traffic management london has scored high on technology and open data singapore scored high on smart traffic management and creative use of technology and Barcelona has scored high on uh, smart parking. So next, I would like to cover artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now we all know AI. What does it refer to? Simulation of human intelligence in machines that are programmed to think like humans and emulate human cognitive capabilities. Now this is a popular uh, slide which tells you that. artificial intelligence these are programs with the ability to learn and reason like humans and then a slightly more advanced step here is the machine learning which is nothing but algorithms with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed and then you have a still advanced step below which is deep learning so it's a subset of machine learning in which artificial neural networks adapt and learn from vast amounts of data so even the now while we do find there is a lot of proliferation of ai and machine learning but international standards organizations have embarked a lot of standardization work in this area because a beat iq now first of all they start they have a special focus group on machine learning for 5g and they have another focus group on artificial intelligence for health and there is a global summit on good ai similarly ic and iso are also doing a lot of work on ai standardization hc is doing a lot of work ieee sa is doing a lot of work i told you p7000 series which is focusing on ethically aligned autonomous and intelligent systems because the challenge is if if the human uh, values and the machine values are not aligned and if they are misaligned imagine what a chaos they would be in the world so we have to ensure that the algorithms that are written and the machines their moral values and their ability is in alignment with the values of the mankind similarly oceanis this is an open community for ethics in autonomous and intelligent systems they provide a high level global forum for discussion debate and collaboration for organizations interested in the development and use of standards to further the development of autonomous and intelligent systems covering algorithms sensors big data ubiquitous networking technologies used in autonomous intelligent systems now even in india 
I mean, uh, there are different ministries who've done some work. Niti Aayog has come out with its policy, uh, National Strategy for AI, AI for All. Then Meti has also come out with uh, some documents. They have published four reports on different aspects of AI. Then uh, you have Ministry of Commerce and Industry also just set up a task force on AI and they have come out with its report. And uh, more importantly, TEC has also come out with, uh, this is an initiative by TEC, by Department of Telecom, that uh, why don't we come out with an India-specific stack for AI? So a committee was set up in 2019 and I would appeal to all of you who have logged in today to do, sort of get in touch with TEC and see what are your interest areas and you may get involved in the working of these working groups. So we have come out with a draft document which has been posted on the DOT website as well as the TC website. And now we have constituted five working groups for AI standardization, India specific stack for AI. And working group one is working on the functional network architecture, AI architecture and data structures. Working group two talks about the types of interfaces and protocols, technologies employed, systems deployed. Group three talks about standardization and trustworthiness, digital rights, ethical standards in AI, preserving algorithm openness, explainability, security, and compliance aspects. These are some of the challenges which are currently being faced in AI. That how do you have a trustworthy, how do you have a non-biased, how do you have an explainable AI? And then you have working group four, which is working on interoperability standards. And five talks about discussion papers, outreach, hackathon, Indian AI stack and stuff like that. So these groups have just been constituted. We had reached out to all stakeholders. We've got a lot of uh, representative, I mean, a lot of uh, nominations, requests for adding them to these groups. So please do write to us. We would be happy to have you and uh, sort of benefit from your expertise. So basically, See, AI is just as much a new frontier for ethics and risk assessment as it is an emerging technology. So it is important to foster a broad and ongoing public dialogue across the governments and corporates and social sectors to build consensus around AI governance and to ensure that it is used to deliver long-term social benefits. Quoting Max Tegmark, I'm sure some of you may have heard it. He's the founder of Future of Life Institute. He has said, just as with rocketry, with rocket science, it is not enough to make our technology powerful. We also have to figure out how to steer it and where we want to go with it. So AI is one of those dangerous technologies and a very powerful technology, wherein it is up to the government, up to the mankind, how we use it. A badly used AI or a non-ethical AI can really cause a lot of chaos in this world. So just like our rocketry, we need to steer this science and see what we want to do with it and where we want it to go. And uh, taking a cue from uh, Unified uh, Payment Interface, UPI and Aadhaar, I think it was felt by the government that it is high time we replicate this kind of uh, interface and stack for AI as well, because if we want to use AI for large scale social benefits, the way we have used UPI and Aadhaar for a lot of our direct benefit transfers and stuff like that, it's high time that we come out with an India specific stack for AI. And even in the telecom networks, AI and ML is being used. In 5G, there is a special focus group on machine learning for future networks, including 5G. And uh, there's a unified architecture for machine learning in future. So IT is also even in the realm of 5G. Clearly, there's a lot of use of machine learning and AI. Now, already work has started in uh, IQ for uh, beyond 2030, uh, 2020. So they have a special group which is now focusing on how life would be or how networks would be towards 2030. Because see, that's the time when... 5G would be peaking in terms of deployments and usages. And it's time that you start launching the next generation of technology or 6G to say so. But for ITU doesn't use the word 6G. 
it uh, uses the word networks 2030 and they have already started working on it and uh, i think uh, the next meeting is uh, sometime in june so you can if you want you can go to the website and uh, similarly in the itut realm also they have uh, defined seven use cases very, very interesting use cases and key network uh, thoughts some of these are uh, holographic type communications these are the new things which they are envisaging for uh, networks beyond 2020 and networks beyond in 2030 so i would like to quickly just uh, cover some of them so what is holographic type communications see it is you wherein you digitally deliver 3d images from one or multiple sources to one or multiple destination nodes in an inter interactive manner so you can foresee that fully immersive 3g imaging will impose great challenges on future networks then you have tactile internet for remote operations wherein you envision that the real time control of remote structure infrastructure is somewhere else and you are remotely monitoring some remotely monitoring your infrastructure so it creates a plethora of opportunities similarly you have uh, digital twin that's a very interesting concept this is usually defined as a real time representation of a physical entity in the digital world so digital twins will add value on top of traditional analytical approaches by improving situational awareness and further enable better responses for physical asset optimization and predictive maintenance and then you are also talking about space and terrestrial integrated networks and last but not the least is your industrial internet of things wherein you are going which is going to be very different from information it technology networks that we are currently used to because these networks need to deliver superior performance and mandate a real time secure and reliable factory wide connectivity as well as inter factory connectivity at large scale in the future so having said this i think the last technological trend which which i would like to briefly cover is blockchain i'm sure we all of us must have heard this term so many times so what exactly is blockchain i'll just like to cover it very briefly so they are immutable digital ledger systems implemented in a distributed fashion without any central repository and without any central authority so basically how does it help see it is it comes from cryptocurrency so it is also therefore used in banking systems e voting land registry systems and recently in the covid-19 vaccine distribution it has been extensively used in united states and even in telecom of course the general perception is that it is being most frequently used in banking sector and we are all aware of bitcoin and those uh, currencies but it is now being thought of being used in telecom networks also in a big way and some of the use cases that are possibly defined for it is iot connectivity and its services because the currently used iot solutions they are highly expensive thanks to the high infrastructure and maintenance costs of centralized cloud services now as the number of iot and connected devices increase these costs will also substantially increase so not all businesses will be able to afford so now in the blockchain where you have a decentralized approach these challenges can be easily overcome by adopting a standardized peer to peer communication model to process the massive volumes of transactions between connected devices so a blockchain will be able to secure an error free peer to peer connectivity connecting thousands of iot devices with cost efficient self managed networks similarly for instance in supply chain logistics you can use this similarly even in prevention of roaming frauds because normally roaming fraud especially in international scenarios could be mitigated by implementing a permissioned blockchain between every pair of operators that have a roaming agreement so automatic triggering of a roaming contract based on call or event data enables near instantaneous charging and reduction in roaming fraud then you have enablement of 5g because as 5g is expected to be ubiquitously available probably selecting the fastest access node for every user or machine will be a central challenge in the future so blockchain can help in creating a new generation of access technology selection mechanisms and they would be in a position to sort of immediately provide for resources based on where exactly is the requirement if it's a ultra reliable low latency kind of an application you need to sort of 
take away resources from all other applications and then pump them in a certain direction based on the application. So all this work can be done very nicely with blockchain. So increasingly, there are lots of usages of blockchain in telecom. Similarly, identity as a service is yet another uh, application which is being thought of. And a lot of standardization work is going on. Uh, NIST in US, they have come out with a lot of documents. Even in ITU, there is a study group uh, which is 16, which is dealing with multimedia aspects of uh, distributed ledger technology. Study group 17 covers security aspects of distributed ledger technology. And TC also has uh, done some work in this area. Uh, we have our uh, officers in the security group who are editors and contributors in a work item in study group 17. So my appeal to all of you that if you're interested in contributing, do reach out to us. We would be very happy to work with you. Now, having said this, I, I come to the end of my presentation, but if I'm not uh, taking too much of your time, do I have five minutes to just uh, conclude after yes, my presentation? Yes, ma'am, you may take time. Yeah, so, I, yeah. so as I said, now I have come to the close of my second theme. So now I want to just quickly cover the third theme. Since we have a lot of students today who might have logged in and a lot of research scholars. And uh, since I was also a student at one point in time, and there were times when uh, you think that everything has gone wrong and that's the end now. So I want to just share some um, lines, you know, which will be highly inspiring and motivating and it will help you sail through when you feel that times are, you're going through a low. Always challenge the status quo, innovate. See, unless we challenge, we will not change. And unless we change, we will not grow. We will not evolve. So change, as they say, is the only constant. So be the change that you wish to see in this world. The test of fire makes strong steel. It is easy enough to be pleasant when life goes by with a song. But the man worthwhile is the one who can smile when everything goes dead wrong. I mean, these are not my sayings. I just want to share it with you all because these are the lines which have sort of kept me going whenever I have faced some kind of an obstacle in my life or in my career. Do not give up. In fact, I would like to share some very interesting lines by Harivan Shrai Bachchan, the father, the great poet and father of Amitabh Bachchan, that apni ichha ka ho to bohat achha hai aur apni ichha ka na ho to aur bhi achha hai kyunki wo prabhu ki ichha hai. If each one of us starts looking at life in this way, how life would change. And do not let the spark in you die down, in spite of come what may. Clearly, I would just appeal to all of you that the years to come are going to be really exciting for us engineers and scientists and would hopefully offer tremendous opportunities to the young and hungry and the questioning and the innovative minds and brains of our students and researchers. And my appeal to the engineering students, innovation is the key to success. Never forget to innovate. In fact, if you look around, companies that have not innovated or evolved with the changing times have either died and disappeared or are struggling for survival. Shake up or ship out. That's the American phrase they say. Adapt or die. Block. Now look at these, some of these examples. I would just like to share only two examples. See, there was once a blockbuster and now there is Netflix. See, Blockbuster had for years been the undisputed champion of the video rental industry. Netflix competing against Blockbuster seemed like a David versus Goliath scenario. But through a series of disruptions and changes to the video and home entertainment industry, the tables turned, leading to Netflix's stunning success and Blockbuster's equally stunning fall. And let's again look at Kodak versus the digital camera. See, there are a few corporate blunders as staggering as Kodak's missed opportunities in digital photography. Because digital photography was a technology which was invented by Kodak, and yet Kodak failed to survive. In fact, a very interesting book by a Kodak executive, an ex-Kodak executive, that's the title of the book, The Decision Loom, a design for interactive decision-making in organizations. He offers advice for how organizations grappling with disruptive technologies might avoid their own Kodak moments. So my appeal to you, all of you is that never forget to innovate. And of course, this could be a different 
talk for a different theme for a different talk on another day but for now i close and thank you it was indeed a pleasure talking to you and uh, i look forward to working with you in any way whatsoever thank you once again for having given me this opportunity for sharing my views thank you thank you very much deepa ma'am for enlightening us with standardization process introduction to mandatory testing in uh, tc 5g its use cases and its current uh, deployment uh, scenarios and you very well explained the foundations of uh, m2m and its different perspectives along with ai ml strategies in telecom network and finally motivating our students thank you very much ma'am for wonderful talk professor harish uh, yeah thank you ma'am uh, this is wonderful uh, talk and uh, we learned a lot uh, let me share uh, with uh, the audience and all the connected people that uh, in 2018 we approached uh, tc uh, telecommunication engineering center for uh, technology approval Okay. At that point of time, we were not aware of uh, whether it is uh, technology approval or uh, it is type approval, and we learned a lot in the process. And ultimately, uh, TEC by taking permission from uh, uh, the member services allowed uh, all the universities, all the such institutions across India to get the technology approval uh, of their products uh, by TEC at par with C dot. so that is the initiative which started in 2018 by the tec uh, now i request uh, uh, pamila madam uh, pamila madam would you like to say something before we uh, yes absolutely what a wonderful what a wonderful presentation the and the depth and breadth that uh, uh, deepa tyagi has covered very very enlightening and i think uh, uh, you know i i i myself learned a lot uh through this uh, presentation and i hope all of you also learned a lot and i would pose a little question uh to um um deepa tyagi uh, about um, uh, what what does she feel is the role that academia can play in standards development and what is your advice to the faculty and students who have logged in today uh, on how to go about this so yeah, that's a very nice question and uh, this has been discussed many times even within the government and uh, when we look at the scenario in the us or in other developed economies we find that there's always been a uh, i mean these are three very important uh, parties you know uh, the government which is the policy maker and the academia and the industry now unless the three work in cohesion things really don't uh, move fast because government has its own uh, radar and its own objectives you know because you have to govern a technology and you have to regulate a technology and there are higher uh, issues you know which the government grapples with in terms of national security and uh, interoperability and multi vendor environment and stuff like that and there has to be a clear road map for a technology it should not happen that we get stuck with one technology and then there is no clear uh, road map and further enhancements and stuff like that so we look at those issues academy of course understands the subject very well the theory part very well but again it's the industry which has to finally take a call and uh, introduce a technology and uh, see whether it's uh, cost effective whether it makes sense because a lot of times there are some very good technologies which did come up but they didn't succeed even if you don't have to go very far if you look in the uh, in 3g i mean there were five technologies which were uh, approved by iq for 5g one was of course the cdma path one was the gsm path one was uh, there was a chinese technology scdma if i remember then there was a japanese uh, uh, variant of 3g and then there was ieee vimax technology so they were all submitted to iq and iq had accepted all the five as clear cut 3g technologies but ultimately even in i mean the other three i don't know they have disappeared i mean we did have trials of vimax in the country in india as well but somehow it couldn't survive ultimately even the chinese i don't think even in china that technology could not survive and finally only two survived but 
in India too, we had licenses of CDMA and GSM. But if you look at the scenario today, CDMA and CDMA 2001X and all, they have not survived. And it's ultimately the GSM and the GSM's roadmap, which has. So ultimately, it's a market-driven technology. I mean, you can't even, the government cannot force. I mean, it's a market-driven the OEM, the cellular, op, the, the licensees have to do it. But the academia can surely guide us, tell us what is the latest. They would help us in the research part. They can contribute. They can articulate India-specific requirements at the SDO level. And uh, surely, I mean, we need to, be, uh, we can benefit a lot from the knowledge and the uh, expertise of the media, which is surely lacking in the government. I mean, we are so busy with uh, policy making that we get very little time to sort of go too much deep into the technology. So it has to be all the three parties working together. And uh, as far as standardization work is concerned, definitely, we look forward to closely working with uh, the academia. Yeah? And uh, many times uh, in a lot of our national working group meetings, uh, we have been told by the professors, you know, some very leading professors. I remember there used to be a professor from IIT, Kharagpur. He would give excellent contributions and we used to call him over. But he used to say that we don't get funds. I mean, we don't get, uh, uh, the management doesn't allow us to come here for this purpose. So if you give us the TA and the DA, uh, traveling allowance and dearness allowance, you would be very happy to come. But otherwise, we are not in a position to come. So there are some issues. And I think uh, we will look into this, how we can encourage more and more participation. But luckily, COVID has helped increased participation because now physical requirement is gone. And I, as you also rightly pointed out, I mean, more and more people can uh, log in and even participation in IQ forums has become I mean, now everybody can just log in, you register and you log in and you can participate. So I hope I've answered your question. So these are all three very important uh, career of the whole uh, chain. Of, uh, right. And I think uh, that's, uh, I think participation in standards and contribution to standards uh, of the research is a big, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, um, is kind of testifies that the research that you are doing is meaningful to society, right? Yeah. So if, yeah. if you are able to ratify it, and I think uh, that is a paradigm shift that our academia needs to uh, needs to make. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, you know, you see, those things don't get converted into a financially viable product. See, and a product that, uh, see, research for research sake is one thing, but then research and then coming out with a technology which really sells like hotcakes. I mean, that is something which, uh, that is the key. Because yeah. otherwise, it just remains a prototype. And that's it. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, Now, I request uh, Dr. Minu Margaret uh, uh, to propose vote of thanks. And uh, I request all the panelists uh, that after the vote of thanks, we will be having a uh, screenshot uh, of all the videos together. So I request all the panelists to uh, switch on their videos. Uh, Dr. Vinu Margaret, please. Um, thank you, Professor Harish. Uh, it is indeed an honor for me to offer a vote of thanks on the occasion of the third Satpal Mittal Memorial Lecture. First and foremost, I would like to thank our worthy and most valued guest, uh, Madam Deepa Tyagi ji. Thank you very much, ma'am, for an enlightening and invigorating presentation on the future trends in telecom technologies. It was indeed a privilege to have an opportunity to listen and to interact with you. On the behalf of Punjab University and UIT, once again, thank you, madam, for having spared your precious time for this event. I wish to express a deep gratitude to the Bharti Enterprises Group who have provided unstinting support in organizing this event year after year. I especially thank Ms. Mickey Kindria and Mr. Ashutosh Kalia from Airtel for taking out time and joining us for today's event. I would like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Raj Kumar, for his patronage and continuous motivation for organizing such expert lectures and fostering innovation. Uh, sir, we are immensely thankful to you for providing your blessings for this event. We are highly indebted to Professor Pamela Kumar for leading and guiding us in organizing today's expert lecture. We thank you, ma'am, for providing constant guidance 
and constantly motivating us to achieve bigger milestones. I would like to extend heartfelt thanks to our worthy director, Professor J.K. Goswami, for supporting us in organizing this event. Sir has extended all required resources and provided direction to make this event successful. Our deep appreciation is due to Professor Renu Vig for mentoring activities under the Bharti chair and planning of today's lecture. Thank you, ma'am, for being our pillar of strength. I would also like to thank my esteemed colleagues, Professor Harish and Professor Sakshi, for working tirelessly in organizing and conducting this event. I would like to thank the entire fraternity of the Institute, faculty members, uh, technical staff, research scholars and students, and acknowledge the contribution of each and every one of you in making this event a huge success. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Professor Renu, uh, can you please switch on the video? Professor Renu? Uh, yeah, can we have a short, please, Iman? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We have. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vanda. Thank you all. Uh, thanks thank for. Uh, thanks all for joining. joining. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Wonderful session. Thank you, Vanda.